Hey YouTube, welcome back to the Crazy Cycling Channel and video 11 of my Fairlight for On Touring Bike Build Series. In this video, I'm going to be installing the drivetrain, and this is the part of the whole build that I'm probably the most excited about. And when I came up with this bike idea, it's also the area where I felt like I could be the most creative. And that's because there are a lot of different options out there. There are, there's a lot of scope for going with something unique and unusual and the gearing really affects what you can do with the bike in my opinion it's something that you really notice if you change it when you're riding your bike so let me tell you now what uh, i came up with for this build okay so i was just going to show you the components i'm going to put on the bike first and then talk about the theory afterwards but i confused myself when i tried to do that so i'm going to just briefly talk about what i was thinking when i came up with this bike idea first and then I'll show you the components I chose to make that happen. And basically with this bike, I wanted a one by touring bike. And most touring bikes still use uh, triple chain rings at the front, and then they'll just have a normal road type derailleur at the back, often an eight speed. So you have a three by eight speed drivetrain. And what I've come up with here is a one by 12 speed drivetrain. And basically the challenge is, first of all, how can you get enough range of gears? And second of all, how can you get a low enough gear um, for touring? And um, I think I talked about this a little bit in some of my other videos, but what I ended up doing is I used my gravel bike and cycled that in different conditions, especially going downhill, and used that to figure out what kind of the lowest high gear I wanted was. And I thought about this all in terms of gear inches, and I won't really explain that all in this, this video too much, but basically I came up with, I wanted something around 85 gear inches at least for the high gear. And then in terms of the low gear, I just went with rules of thumb for touring, and the rule of thumb is that you should have a low gear of about 18 gear inches. So the range I needed was 18 to 85. And the question is how can you achieve that with a one by system? Turns out it's not that easy, uh, the best way is with mountain bike gears that will do that. But the problem is that those are not compatible with road bike shifters, neither for SRAM nor Shimano. Uh, there are ways of doing it. You can get different converters that convert pull ratios. I think there's micro shift or some, some of the less well-known companies make drop bar shifters that work with, uh, road, uh, with mountain bike derailers. But a lot of those don't use hydraulic brakes and obviously I got hydraulic brakes on the bike. Uh, so what I ended up coming up with is I'm gonna put a mountain bike cassette on the back of this bike and I'm combining that with, actually it's a 10 to 51 tooth mountain bike cassette and I'm combining that with a 32 tooth chain ring um, and that's giving me a range of gear inches using 700C wheels and 40 millimeter tires of approximately 17 and a half to about 88. So quite a big range and a nice low gear. The trade-off with the system, there's two trade-offs at least that I know of. One is you're only using one chain ring, so you're gonna wear that chain ring more than you would if you were spreading that wear over two or three chain rings. And the other, I just forgot it. What was the other thing that I was worried about? Let me think about that for a sec. <laughs> Oh yes, the other thing is efficiency of your pedaling because road cyclists like to pedal at the same cadence. So they'll always pedal at the same cadence and change their gears depending on the terrain. But in order to do that, you really need a lot of gears. That's why road bike cassettes are so compact because they want small jumps between the gears. A mountain bike cassette's not gonna do that. It's gonna have big jumps between the gears because in mountain biking, it's less important to cycle at a constant cadence, it's more important to have that big range and to have those low gears. So those are kind of the things you're trading off with this. But the pro of a, a drivetrain like this is, first of all, simplicity. A one by system is great. Front derailers are really annoying. Uh, you may be probably saving a little bit of weight as well. Um, uh, the, so the main thing, but I guess the main thing is just simplicity and also to a certain extent, reliability just because you don't have that front derailleur to deal with and you don't have to deal with those 
annoying shifts that you get on double and triple chain, uh, chain sets uh, where you have to think about what gear you're in at the front and the back and your chain's not shifting properly at the front. Rear derailers are much better than front derailers and all that stuff just sort of really attracted me to the one by system. And I don't know if I mentioned it already, but the other thing that's kind of cool is I'm using a 12 speed system. And that's just because I found that I had compatible components. Um, so, so some people say that with a 12 speed, your chain is thinner. So your chain might not be as reliable and that's possible. That's another possible con. Um, but other people say that that doesn't affect the chain reliability. Um, so there's trade-offs with this, pros and cons, but I just think it's pretty cool. So basically it's a mountain bike drivetrain on a drop bar bicycle. Okay, so mountain bike gears on a drop bar bicycle sounds simple in theory, but in practice it's a pain. As I already alluded to, most road bike shifters won't work with mountain bike um, derailers. So you have to find a way around that. And the other problem is it's hard to find a road bike crank set that can take a small enough chain ring. Basically you need a road bike crank set that can take direct mount chain rings. So I'll just recap the um, crank set again. This is a Praxis Works Alba and that can take SRAM direct mount um, chain rings, which is I think maybe a coincidence or I'm not really sure. And that's kind of an ob obscure fact. Um, but to make this more interesting, I guess the bike is backwards in the stand, so you can't really see that side. I should probably turn the bike around. But uh, I've got the Praxis Alba here. And then instead of using a SRAM chain ring, I used the um, Wolf Tooth Camo system, which is basically a chain ring spider. And that can take different chain rings. And then I've got a 32 tooth chain ring. But to make it even more interesting, I've gone with an oval chain ring. So it's an oval 32 tooth chain ring. And in addition, the tooth profile in the chain ring is designed for 12 speed Shimano chains because 12 speed Shimano chains uh, need compatible chain rings and cassettes. Speaking of the cassette, here it is. You can see that it's a big old mountain bike cassette. Again, this is a Shimano, what is it? It's not written on here, but it's a Shimano SLX 12 speed cassette, 10 to 51. So this has a 10 tooth a small gear and a 51 tooth big gear, which is a huge range. The main thing with this cassette is that this needs a micro spline driver. Micro spline is the free hub body standard. Uh, so this will not work on the old, it's called a Shimano HG drivers, hyperglide, hypo, hyperglide, hypo hyperglide drivers, which is what all the road bike stuff still uses and most 11 speed stuff. The 12 speed stuff needs a special free hub because otherwise you can't get a, uh, a 10 tooth little, little cog uh, to fit around the free hub. So this is the micro spline. The other option would be a SRAM XD driver, but I decided to go Shimano and this is the cassette giving me huge range and a nice big low gear or small low gear. Okay, so that takes care of the chain ring and the cogs, but in order to shift those gears, you need a shifter obviously. So I'm using the micro shift BS dash M12 dash R and it's a bar end shifter. So it's still in the packaging here, but basically, well, I can take it out, I guess. There is a piece here, which fits into the end of the handlebars. And I'll pick that up in a sec. Uh, then the other piece is basically a lever and that allows me to control all 12 gears from the end of the bar. The good thing about this is this specific bar and shifter is completely compatible with the Shimano 12 speed mountain bike system. So I don't need any converters, any adapters or anything. I can just plug the cable straight into here and it should work right out of the box. And that overcomes the last hurdle with this, which again is the fact that your STI levers usually don't work with mountain bike derailers. The brake levers I'm using here are actually Shimano GRX, which is a really nice brake lever. GRX is a good system. Um, but that's a 10 speed system and I didn't really want 10 speed and that also doesn't work with mountain bike stuff. Um, so I'm actually using the GRX just for the ergonomics of the hoods and to control the brakes. So I've got a Shimano braking system as well. Um, but the shifting is going to be done with the micro shift bar and shifter, the BS M12R. Okay. And then the chain is a Shimano CN dash M7100. I think this is an SLX level, a chain which is one step above the Dior, which is the lowest Shimano 12 speed group set. 
And the thing is, if you're using a Shimano 12-speed drivetrain, my understanding is that you need to be using a Shimano 12-speed chain. Now, it's possible a chain from another manufacturer might work, but they've basically changed the profile of the teeth on the chain rings and the um, cassette cogs for better shifting performance. And to get that benefit, you need to have a Shimano 12-speed chain. That's a con in my opinion, because you're kind of limited then in what kind of chain you can use. Uh, but I decided to go with that anyway. It could be the same for SRAM, for SRAM's new 12-speed, I'm not sure. But with 10-speed and 11-speed stuff, you could pretty much interchange everything as far as the chains. Uh, with the 12-speed, it's becoming much more specific, um, which, you know, the benefit potentially is maybe better shifting, but the con is, again, that the stuff is just becoming more specialized. Um, but yeah, the SLX is one step above the Dior. I probably would have just gone with a Dior if it was available, but when I was buying chains, everything was out of stock. Um, and I think I did some research about which level chain was had the longest life expectancy. I, I'm not sure if I was able to get kind of the best cost per performance chain, but I think it was the SLX. So that's kind of why I went with the SLX as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I mean, it's just a chain, but because it's 12 speed, it's something you still have to think about a little bit. At least that's my understanding. All right, and then finally we come to the cables, which I'm, I'm just gonna talk about as well. The first cable I bought was this Shimano Road Shift cable set. And I had another one that I used on my gravel bike and the outer cable was a bit short. This is a 1700 millimeter and it didn't really reach the derailleur and I want full external cable housing. Uh, so I got this Jaguar kit. I think it's a bit longer, I hope so. It was a long time ago as well when I was researching this stuff. But turns out that a lot of road shift cable sets are kind of short and I'm not really sure why. I don't know if road bikes mostly don't use full internal cables in contrast to mountain bikes, um, but I think this Jaguar kit is gonna be the one to use. I've also got some random internal cables. I think those came with the GRX and that one came with a micro shift bar and shifter. So I've got lots of internal cables and a couple different options here, but I'm gonna deal with that at the end. First thing here is that I'm gonna install the cassette onto the wheel. This is getting exciting now because it's really starting to come together and be a complete bike now. So I was about to start taking the wheel off the bike and realized I forgot to talk about the derailleur. So the derailleur is actually a Shimano XT 12-speed mountain bike derailleur. Again, compatible with the 12-speed cassette as well as the micro shift bar and shifter. And the reason I went with the XT is this is a more higher end derailleur. The main reason is because it has ball bearings. Since then, I've kind of been thinking if it's worth it. So the thing with ball bearings is I, they, they probably are smoother. They probably should last a long time. But what happens if a bearing wears out on one of these uh, pulley wheels? Does that even happen? And if so, uh, what can I do? I mean, is it easy to get uh, pulley wheels in other countries? I'm not really sure. So then I started thinking maybe I should have gone with a lower end Shimano derailleur, which would have had just bushings in the pulley wheels. But that was my thinking when I got the XT and the XT uh, was not a lot more expensive than the SLX or the Dior. Um, if I was just going a bit lower end, I'd probably just go for Dior. I remember when I bought the components for my mountain bike upgrade, which I didn't really film. I think that one has the SLX derailleur and I can't remember why I didn't go with Dior. I think in that case, it was because the Dior was out of stock everywhere because of COVID. Um, so I think I got the SLX on that bike and here I went for the XT just because I like the idea of the ball bearings in the uh, pulley wheels. Okay, let's go ahead and install the cassette. Right, there it is. And what I don't want to have happen is I don't want anything to fall apart. Actually, this might be a one-piece cassette. Mm. Uh, no, I don't think so. There's a little plastic piece holding everything together, but let's get the wheel over here and see if I can keep everything from falling apart. There's a little plastic thing. Another plastic thing. Oops. 
Can I pull that out of there? Let's get maybe a pair of pliers. Nope, that's really stuck in there pretty bad. Do I have to take the whole thing apart? Let's see. Maybe you have to take it out from the top. <laughs> you have to take it out from the top. Okay. That's interesting. Now, of course, <laughs> exactly what I was afraid of. Now these things are starting to move around. Let's see if I could just get this piece on. And usually, I actually haven't used micro spline, but I can see it here already. There's a tooth here that's bigger than all the rest. And that should line up with something on the free hub body, which matches. Let's see if I can see that. Yep. You probably couldn't see that, but there is only one way that this cassette can go onto there. And now I need to do everything else here in the same order. So that should go like so. Then a spacer. The next one also like so. Or like so. Something, there we go. Spacer. Uh, and then no more spacers. Now I just get two here. That one like, let's see. Yep, like so. Same thing here. And that's the stack of cogs. Now I need to just put the lock ring in place. And this lock ring is just like with the disc rotors, it uses the FR-5.2 uh, cassette tool. And I am gonna put a little bit of the anti-seize on these threads as well. And then torque this to uh, 40 Newton meters, which is kind of the typical torque for the stuff. This ring feels plastic, which is kind of weird. I would have thought it would have been uh, an aluminum or something, but it really feels like plastic. But anyway, let's just get a bit of his anti-seize on the threads. My threads aren't really catching what's going on there. Yep, that should just spin onto there. Let's see here. That's on there pr properly. That's on properly. That's still full of anti seize. Let's just try with the cassette tool. No, that's not working. So what does that mean? Am I missing something here? It did just spin on a second ago. I think I've got the instructions for the cassette. So I'm gonna double check and just make sure I'm not missing something really obvious here. Okay, well, it turns out there were just a couple of these cogs that weren't quite seated right. So I just needed to go through and adjust two of them. And now the lock ring has started to turn into its threads. So I've got the uh, cassette tool here and I'm just gonna tighten that by hand. And then I'm gonna get a torque wrench out and I'm gonna set that to about 40 Newton meters, which is over there. And again, 40 Newton meters is less than you think. It's really not all that much. So um, yeah, if you don't have a torque wrench, it's, it's, you don't have to really go crazy with these cassette lock, ring tool, lock rings. I used to do that. Uh, but then you could seize your lock ring and you could end up with a mess. Um, so it's better to go a little bit lighter on this. But now I'm just going to use the torque wrench. I don't know if you can see this, but... And it clicked right there. So let's just double check. And that's 40 Newton meters. So I th I'd say that's... It is fairly snug, but it's really nothing outrageous. You don't need to go crazy with this. 
And then if you have a torque wrench like this, you always want to back it off to uh, zero when you're done using it. All right, let's go ahead and get the rear wheel installed back onto the bike. This is all quite a lot heavier now. Cool, how does that look? That looks awesome. Got another silver and black thing going on there to match kind of the whole thing going on with the bike. Let's just spin this. You know, the brake is rubbing so, so slightly on this back wheel, but that's awesome. Um, yeah, three wheels as well. I think the next thing to do is to install that rear derailleur, which is here. And I'm gonna put some anti-seize on the mounting bolt and then install it here. And the interesting thing about this frame, which I talked about, I think in the first video, is there's an integrated derailleur hanger here, which I've never seen before. So you just screw the derailleur straight into the frame. That might be normal on steel bikes. I'm not quite sure, but usually on aluminum bikes, you have a separate derailleur hanger, which is a sacrificial piece um, to keep your, you from damaging your frame. But since the frame is steel and the derailleur hanger is steel, um, I kind of think that's a good idea because this should all be nice and strong. Uh, the only downside is if you do crash, you're probably going to damage your derailleur. But I don't think you damage the frame and I don't think you damage that hanger either. And worst comes to worst, you could still straighten that derailleur hanger. But anyway, let's get some anti-seize onto this bolt. Just onto the... Actually, let's squirt it. Um, yeah, let's just squirt it into that derailleur hanger. I think that's easier. And this particular mounting bolt is a five millimeter Allen key. That's probably pretty typical. In fact, that's probably standard. And you really don't want to cross thread this because, sorry, there's noises going on in the house. Um, yeah, you don't want to damage those threads because since that is your frame, you could probably repair that, but you would be a little bit screwed. All right, and I am going to torque this to the correct torque, which is eight to 10 Newton meters. And again, I've got the Topeak beam style torque wrench here, which is a really nice and really affordable tool. Really great way to get started uh, measuring the torques on the little fasteners on your bike. So I've got the five mil bit in here and let's torque that to about eight to 10 Newton meters. That's about six already. Eight to 10 isn't really that much. It's about nine. And that's about 10. So there we go, derailleur is now installed. Okay, so I think that the next thing I'm gonna do here is to install the chain. But in order to install it, I first need to shorten it to the correct length. And 12 speed chains aren't shortened the same way that any other chains are. And there is a video on YouTube about how to do this. There's also, if you Google 12 speed chain length, there's at least one website that explains it. But uh, even though I just referred to that, I already forgot because it kind of depends on how you end up with your chain wrapped around the cogs and crank sets. But the first thing to do is to wrap the chain around the uh, chain ring and the largest cog at the back. Uh, this is really starting to feel like I'm starting to use the bike now, which is a little bit sad, but um, let's go ahead and maybe start here at, maybe start at the front. And, hmm, are these chains directional? That does not seem to want to work. I hope the tooth profile is correct here, but it could also just be that everything is new. Um, the tooth profile on the chain ring should be specific to the Shimano 12 speed system. And I'm, that's what I wanted to order. If I bought the wrong thing, that's my fault. Um, but let's see if I can get, if I can't get that to work. Okay. That works now. I guess these chains must be, they must be directional because that just slipped onto there really easily. But anyway, let's go ahead and now thread the chain through here. 
and you basically want your chain resting on the largest cog here and sort of finishing here at the back. And now I'm gonna take this end of the chain, wrap it around as tightly as I can. And now this finishes with where this chain would be pinned together here. An inner link is the first link that comes off of the chain. I'll bring you in for a close up now uh, and that gives me a chance to just double check exactly what I need to do next. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. All right, now I'm once again going to pull the chain as tight as it will comfortably go. And you know, the chain ring I'm using here is an elliptical chain ring. So I kind of wonder how that orientation will affect it, but I did play with that a little bit and it doesn't seem to have that big of an effect. So the comfortable place for this chain to be is like so. And you might not be able to see this, but basically I have a point here where the two ends of the chain could meet and then a short section of tail extending away from the cog. And the first link here is an inner link. And the rule is since this is an inner link first, I want to count five links and then break the chain after those five links. So here I've got one, two, three, four, five. And then after this inner link here is where I'm gonna break the chain. And then I'll still have my quick link to then connect the two ends of the chain together. So what I'm gonna do is let's just double check that again, triple check that just to be sure I don't end up with the wrong chain length because that would be a disaster. You can't really put these narrow chains together very well. You really have to use a quick link. But anyway, we have here one, two, three, four, five. This is the point I wanna break the chain. So I'll get my chain tool right away, which in my case is on my multi-tool. And we're gonna thread that right onto the chain just so I don't lose my place. It should be right in there. And before I break that, I'm gonna just double check that I'm doing this rule right and then we'll go ahead and break the chain. Yep, looks like that was the right rule. I think it was five links past where the chain comes together. Uh, so now we can break the chain moan of truth because you really can't put these chains back together. I've tried, you really need a quick link. Uh, ooh, yeah, that's right. Pushing that pin out. What happens with these pins is the pin will get damaged when you push it out and that's why you can't really put these chains together. I used to be really good at putting chains together uh, that I'd taken apart back with like eight speed mountain bikes. But with this modern stuff, you can't really do that. So there's my little piece of chain. And if I were to show you this closely, which I can't really with a GoPro, there's a little piece of metal stuck there. And that is part of the pin, which is basically sheared off. So that's basically junk. And now we have our hopefully correct length chain. Now let's go route it around the derailleur and put it on the bike. Okay, so that's the chain now, hopefully cut to the correct length. And now I need to thread it around the chain ring through the rear derailleur and around the cassette. But I'll bring you in for a close up because it's really easy to mess this up when you're threading the chain through the derailleur. And if you do that, you can start wearing away some of the components here at, at the back. So I'll just show you that and then we'll get this chain installed. Okay, so first let's route the chain around the chain ring. And one thing I learned today is that the way this chain sits on the teeth of the chain ring is important. So like this, the chain won't engage the teeth on the chain ring properly. But if I move the chain one tooth, the chain will engage properly everywhere. At first I thought this was a directionality thing and that it mattered which way the chain was turned. So say I turned the chain like this, then it would fit, but it's not. It will work either way, but it has to be uh, on the correct teeth. If it's offset by one, the chain won't fit. But here we go. Now the chain fits properly around the chain ring and now we can route the chain ring, uh, sorry, the chain around the cassette and the derailleur. Okay, now the chain is being routed around the smallest cog and then it goes around the top of this top pulley wheel. And then the trick is that with this derailleur, the chain has to go inside of 
this tab, which you might not be able to see, let's just pull that through. There is a little tab here between the two derailleur cages. And with this derailleur, the chain has to go basically, uh, I'd say the inside, but it's basically the top of that tab. On some derailleurs, it, the chain has to go on the other side and it's really easy to get that mixed up. And if you do, you'll start wearing away that little tab. But in this case, it looks like it comes around the top of the tab and then around the bottom pulley. One of these is called the tension pulley and one is called the guide pulley, but I never remember which. So I'm gonna call them the top pulley and the bottom pulley. Um, and then I need to join the chain, which I'm gonna do with a quick link. Okay, so my multi-tool has a really nice feature to help put chains together. And that's basically a piece of hooked wire, which is stored against the chain tool. You can obviously use a piece of coat hanger or something like that, but what this does is this helps you hold the chain in place when you install the quick link, and this makes this a lot easier. So basically you just hold the chain like so, and then I have a quick link somewhere here in one of my pockets. There it is. This is basically two half links of chain. One side of the quick link goes through from the outside. The other side goes through from the inside on the adjacent link to be joined. Then you kind of push everything together and pull apart. And to help pull this apart, I like using some quick link pliers. And this should now just pull apart. Let's see here. Come on. There we go. And then you can just undo the little wire. And why is my chain so floppy? Seems like the chain is way too long. So there's something going on here. Uh, yeah, let me think about this for a sec and then come tell you what's up. Okay, so this problem had me stumped for a while. At first I thought maybe I had the wrong chain length, but I was pretty sure that I cut the chain correctly. So I kept staring at this and I think I've seen what the problem is. Can you see it? Did one of you guys catch me when I was installing the derailleur? So I don't know how well this comes up on the video, but this screw here is the B screw. And right now the screw is pressing directly against uh, this little tab at the bottom of the derailleur hanger. Um, but there's a piece of metal here around the um, derailleur mounting screw and that should be turned so that there's another little tab in between the derailleur hanger and the B adjustment screw. And I think that if I reorient this derailleur, the chain will be tight. Let's try it. Okay, so again, it's the five millimeter Allen key to take this off. And it's pretty tight on there because I checked with a torque wrench. Um, so I need to just take this off. And again, I don't want to cross thread anything. And there's a little tab right there. You might not be able to see that, but that tab needs to be on this side of the derailleur hanger. So let me just start screwing this back into the derailleur hanger. And then I'm gonna pull this back. This might not actually be that easy. Maybe if I get some tension off of there. You know, I have to just unscrew this completely. Let's try that again. There we go, that's about right. Now, to do that without stripping anything, or messing up any threads, that's what I really don't wanna do here. Hmm. There's probably a way of doing this that I just don't know. Why, why is that so hard? Maybe like that. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> kind of cutting into my hand. Right, is that cross-threaded? Ooh. Is that cross-threaded? I hope not. That feels suspiciously difficult to turn. Uh, I'm gonna take that out again because I don't wanna, 
I don't want to mess up my derailleur hanger. That wouldn't be good. That would be a very expensive mistake. Right. One of you knows a better way of doing this, let me know. Okay, that's definitely going into the threads. Okay, and I think that's fixed the problem as well. Okay, and now let's double check that with a torque wrench. That was eight to 10 Newton meters. That's about 10 right there. Double check. Yep, that's about 10. And yep, the chain is now tight. Okay, so that was kind of a frustrating mistake. It took me a minute to find that, but now everything is mounted properly. And check this out. If I spin the crank set, the wheel spins, so it's actually a bicycle now. And the other thing I can do here is I can turn on the derailleur clutch. That will help the chain, keep the chain from falling off of the cogs or off of the um, chain ring due to slackening. And this chain shouldn't really fall off much anyway because the tooth profile here on the chain ring is very, very high. So one debate I'm having right now with myself is whether or not, whether or not to put any protection on the frame here. And I don't know if I will, I don't know if it's necessary. And I think the bike might be easier to clean without that. What do you guys think? But anyway, that's gonna be the video for today. I do still obviously need to install the shifter as well as the shift cable but I'm gonna leave that for the next video, I think, because otherwise I could see this video getting really, really long again. Uh, so that's coming out next week, but I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, as always, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it very, very much. Hope you're having a great day, and maybe I'll see you in the next Fairlight build or one of my other videos. Uh, thanks again, and take care.